So I'm here with Russell Nolte, an amazing author and businessman who learned how to actually leverage books to have an awesome business. Now, I know a lot of you guys are interested in that kind of thing. So I thought, why not talk to Russell? And uh, maybe you could learn a few things from this talk. So how are you doing, Russell? Doing very well, very well. Thanks for having me on. Awesome, awesome. Uh, do you want to just talk a bit, just a minute or two about yourself? Sure. So um, I'm a writer, uh, publisher, and consultant. So I run Wannabe Press, which is a small press publisher that makes books and comics. Uh, our tagline is we make weird books for weird people. Um, and then I also host a podcast called The Business of Art, which uh, shows creatives how to build their creative business, how to sell more, how to build a brand, and um, basically how to make their business sustainable. So those are sort of the two pieces. And I also help people like yourself or, you know, other business people, you know, make their first book or make a book that can lead them down the sales funnel chain. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. What's, what's like your worst, your best and your worst experience as you kind of started learning this shit? <sighs> uh, probably when my fourth business failed. That's pretty bad in my, when I, in my 20s. Yeah. Um, so I had a bunch of, I started writing movies and television. Um, and then we started a couple production companies and all of them miserably, like miserable. Like it's not even funny how bad they failed. Like not even, barely, didn't, barely got off the ground. Like it's almost like they couldn't even fail because they didn't get off the ground. And so I went back and I knew I could write. Like I'm a very good writer but I didn't know sort of what the, the commonality was me. Commonality was me. Uh, you fail one, that might be a fluke. You fail two, it might be market conditions. You fail four, like, and, and you're, you're the common denominator of why you fail. Um, that's not saying you're a failure, but like, I certainly felt like a failure. Uh, so I went through and I said, well, what, what is going on? Like, what is the, what, what is, what am I missing here? And it turned out that, um, I, I didn't know how to do sales and marketing. I, like most creatives, just decided that, thought, and most business people I have found, thought that you launch a thing and then people come out of the woodwork. And so they I spent, build, and, build it and they will come. Right, exactly. And that is absolutely the opposite. Like find people uh, for a long time and then you can launch to them and they will buy your thing. But it's the inverse of what most people think. Like find the audience and then deliver them a thing. Mm -hmm. So I learned, so this was, it was about 29 and I'm a big believer that you should be able to dick around as much as you want in your twenties. Um, and like have as many crappy jobs, but you better have a backup plan by the time you're 30. So I had spent my twenties, like writing things and optioning things and, you know, being a flighty kind of artist mm -hmm. and, uh, my thirties were coming up. So I decided, well, um, I need to get a job. I wasn't really qualified for anything except for sales. Um, so I wasn't even really qualified for sales, but well, like, every, everybody's qualified for sales. Yeah. They'll take almost anybody at the beginning. Um, so I worked and it was really hard for the first couple of years. You know, I bumped around to a bunch of stuff, but I finally landed at uh, sprint, which is a, uh, us based cellular retailer. I worked at one of their third party, uh, business to business stores. So we only sold to business to business. And so this was someone who was basically reselling sprint products, drop shipping them. Um, and I was really bad at first, but they kept me on. I was making just enough, like, till I justify my position. Um, and then eventually I worked my way up to a uh, sales manager. And then I was training um, all of their, I, I ran like a store for them. Um, as they transitioned from LA to Texas, I ran a store for them. And then I started my own uh, Verizon dealership and left that job and then sort of so I learned the sales and marketing piece, um, but I, the sales and marketing piece isn't, um, it isn't the same industry as I'm sure you know, like it's all different. It's, if you can sell one thing, you can sell everything else, but there are different widgets and terminologies in every business. So you got to, so, so I spent the next couple like year trying to fit a, uh, I fit how I was working with cellular into how to sell art and how to sell creativity and how to sell 
uh, like writers and business people and entrepreneurs who don't who don't like have a physical store or really a physical product. Almost like creating a physical product for somebody that has no physical product yet. Yeah, you're you're also it's a completely different need. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but the best part. So that was the worst part. The best part I'm transitioning to. I didn't forget. Uh, so, uh, the best part was when it started working. So, um, this was the, we launched our first thing in 2015 and I'm a big believer in screwing up your own stuff before you sell other people's things. So we spent sort of screwed up a lot in the, like the first round of, uh, the first slate of books we had out were, uh, we were making them for too much and selling them for too little. But so like the last year and a half, sort of since June of 2015, where I left my job to do this full time, I, I've sort of been trying to refine how to make a creative business work and systematize it. And once it started working, once I started to be able to like process, like make a process and predict how much I was going to make based on you know, how many people were at a show or all of these sort of hypotheses I was making actually started to come into play and I started increasing my sales exponentially. I, that was the best um, because I, it's, always the, it's always amazing to me. It's still when I can say, this is the thing that came out of my head uh, and have somebody buy it and say, okay, I want to take $20, which I, like, I, I they they made some way i don't know how they made it and i will like buy the thing that's in your in your head yeah um, and to be able to do that on a mass level where like you can sell hundreds of books from people that don't know who you are get them to convert right on the spot uh that's pretty amazing yeah yeah that's that's awesome i <laughs> mean I mean, I, I opened the, the YouTube channel again like three months ago because I decided to go from local to online again and work uh, worldwide. And it's also like just an idea like, hey, I'm going to coach people and charge like 2000 a month for that. And, you know, like a week later, I think I got my first client. Somebody like watched my video, really liked it, contacted me. We talked for like an hour and he's like, yeah, sure, man, let's, let's go. And I'm like, whoa, like a week ago, this was like, here <laughs> so well, yeah when you when you know the process you you can turn it into reality it's it's really fun <laughs> right yeah and there's this um there's this thing which is like there's a lot of hypotheses floating around in your head at any one time most businesses my head at any one time that i'm testing out and then most of them are fail most of them are not correct hypotheses mm -hmm which is fine. That's how science works. Like most of the hypotheses that a biologist or a chemist or a pharmacist or, or, or uh, someone who's making like another pill, like the next like weight loss pill, they're mostly failing. Um, but when you get that hypothesis that sticks and you're like, Oh, I thought this. And like, that is actually the truth of it. Yeah. It's pretty like, it, it's a pretty crazy thing to uh, to imagine it, it usually works it's like it's never like the first thing it's like it, it's so fur further along the way the one that actually works you like you know you, you just go through the thing you know like you try this doesn't want this doesn't want this doesn't work and then you're like oh, okay now let's try this and then you get a result and you're like what like it, it worked and you're like right what yeah, am i <laughs> It and and my, almost, my, almost my whole career has been about uh, failing faster and more rapidly. So rapid prototyping, rapid iteration. Yeah. Because what I found is the people that sit on an idea for a long time um, end up having a crappy idea. Um, the ones that are out there iterating on it and talking to people about it and like building up the hype for it. Mm -hmm. Those are the people that end up successful, not because their initial idea was better, but because they talked to so many people and had so many failed iterations of it. Yeah, I think I think any idea could work, but the people, what the execution is, where you have to be a master. And the crappier right. the idea, the better the execution should be. But uh, you know, better ideas they need they don't need as as be, as good execution because it's a good idea inherently. But right. uh, 
But when you have that yeah. great idea that also has great execution, that's where you oh. get drop off. That yeah, that's like the one that gets you to millionaire status usually, or you know, it could be the next level. Right, exactly. And you know, I've had, you know, still a lot of our books that come out don't don't. Uh, so how we how our books work is we we short run them first uh, to test whether they are viable. So can a you, short can run. You... Like, Oh, thank you. I just was about to ask what the short run, So like when, when you go to a book like, uh, like Ichabod back here, uh, we get a uh, thousand or more books. That's a, uh, that's an offset print run. Um, so we're spending a lot less per unit, but our overall costs are a lot more. So, so physical, so, physical book. Yeah. Physical book. So I don't want to print a thousand of the Ichabod books before I know that people are going to buy them. Right. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I get short runs of these digital books, which this one's not out yet. This is just a prototype. This is my next book. Um, uh, and so we'll get like 50 or 100 of these short runs and see if we can sell them quickly or as quickly as we need to in order to believe that it's you know, a viable product. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our books never get out of this stage. In fact, so far, only two books that we've put out have gotten out of this short run stage and been like full and done like full on production runs. Mm. So, um, like we've had four, five, six, eight, 10, 12 books of which 10, eight to 10 are still in short run status because I'm not gonna spend $6,000, $10,000, $20,000 to get a bunch of books that are just gonna sit in my, um, that are just gonna sit in my garage. Another thing we use the, sh the, 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 uh, the, uh, the validation, this is like standard textbook validation of a concept, right? Um, we also had tried a, a kids' book division this year. We, th we, we thought that somebody who likes our books also has kids or young people that they need books for, and they would buy our books and then buy books for their kids. So that was our assumption. It absolutely monumentally failed, did not work. Uh, uh -huh. But, you know, I was able to validate the concept, repay the book art, the artwork, and the cost of production on a short run of books uh, because, you know, we didn't do 2,000 or 5,000 at once. So, so it's very similar to what people do on Facebook, for example, when they do it, an ad where you don't have to buy a campaign on TV. You can just, you know, s spill out a bit of money, see how you can even see, you don't even need to see the sales. You can actually see like the click through the, you know, how much, how many people subscribed and, there's a funnel going so you can actually very quickly know if the shit is working or not. <laughs> right. And, and even books that go, so like the, the Ichabod book that, that went to a, 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 an offset run. Um, when we, we did a short run of that and Katrina first, which are the two books that, uh, that, that, that basically earned out and, and deserved it because we could justify the cost. Um, we were able to during that short run tighten up all of our sales pitch for every for that book and find out the exact reasons why people wanted it the exact places that pe that it would sell better mm -hmm. and we could do that without having to basically uh go to a bunch of shows with a bunch of product and then not sell out of that show mm, so now so, we have a yeah. couple of books so now we have a couple of books that uh basically can, uh, we know will earn, will like make a show justifiable. So we could justify our cost with just these two books and hopefully we can bring in more books that then can, can, can be multiples of this instead can of. Can you show the book? Uh, with this one? Which uh, one? The Ichabod book? Uh, both of them for like five seconds, maybe. Sure, so Ichabod is about a, uh, it's about a psychopath that escapes a mental asylum and becomes a monster hunter, but you never know if he's killing monstrous humans or it's all in his head the whole time. Yeah, but can you can you describe describe while you show the book? Like what oh, you want to see? Sure. All right. Oh, yeah, so, show it like like while you describe it. Yeah. So we uh so for this one we did a uh, exclusive. This is an exclusive hardcover of the book, so we wanted to make it a prestige thing. So the mm -hmm. the titles only on the side and the back, not on the front, because we only have, can sell these or sell them on our site we made them different than our distributor editions. Mm -hmm. So, and then, um, so this is our, this usually has black inside. Sorry, this is Do our- you have like a, like a knife inside it? Huh. It doesn't, but it has a really cool uh, ribbon. 
Oh, shit. That, that, that looks so awesome. I love uh, digital, com- digital comics like these. Graphic yeah, so comics. Is, I think so this, is about a, so, uh, this is about a psychopath that escapes a mental asylum and becomes a monster hunter, but you never know if he's killing monsters, humans, or it's all in his head the whole time. So it's four issues, epilogue, and back matter content, like Johnny the Homicidal Maniac, uh, or traditional Japanese manga. And then we have a bunch of process stuff in the back to show you how we made the book. So um, wow. Wow. basically, basically uh, so that's one. And then we have, uh, this one doesn't have a perfect pitch yet, but uh, you can see this cover, Worst Thing in the Universe, the back. I don't know if we can curse on your show, but it says God effing. Uh, God fucking Ross. hates. What? What Albert does he Ross. hate? Albert Ross. So that the main Albert character's Ross. name is Albert Ross. So our goal, since we most do most of our selling at shows, we want someone to pick up the book, read the back, get a chuckle, and open the first chapter of the book. I mean, I which, mean any, any, any Chuck Palahniuk fan would instantly pick this up. Right. It's, so it's like Chuck Palahniuk, Douglas Adams, and, uh, and Kurt Vonnegut all blended together, basically. It's about God gleefully watching as karma craps on the richest guy in the universe for 300 pages. <laughs> <laughs> and so we kind, of have our, like, we have, kind of have our niche for weird books for weird people. And we make, like, so that's, these yeah, are- uh, like, weird, weird books for awesome people, you know? Well, I- like, Give me, respect. <laughs> To me, weird and awesome are the same because. Oh yeah, uh, awesome. No, but, but there uh, are, there are genuinely weird things though. Like, there are things that are genuinely weird in the bad way. <laughs> yeah, I guess most things that like I, I find very few things that are weird in the bad way. Most of the things that I uh, that I find are weird in the good way, and that so. Um, and we both, and then we go to shows and sell it. But you know, over the year, by doing this over and over and over again we have a repeatable process for so 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 you're not this huge business you're not this you know massive famous guy you don't have like 50 books like brian Brian tracy um you're just a guy who has a business you know who sells books you know among other things but you basically made books profitable Right. Yeah, so I, I found ways to make books profitable, basically. So, so I'll, 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 ask it, I'll ask it again, just to, because I, I want to, you know, kind of like this. And so if somebody is like really passionate about writing books, he's like, he doesn't want to be an entrepreneur, you know, in the, in the common sense. He doesn't want to open a regular business. He doesn't want to do coaching. He just wants to write books. And he's not even thinking about making, you know, millions. He's just saying, I want to write books and make enough money to live well, you know, as, as a baseline, at least, you know, in the sure. next year or so. That's possible? In the next, so... Maybe two say, years, even. So I, so I will tell you that artists make their, uh, writers make their living on the back catalog. The back catalog are the books that they put out before their current book. So the more books you put out, the more successful you will become. Because every time a new book comes out, it will increase the sales of your previous books. So if you've only got one book and somebody likes that book and you have nothing else, they have nothing to go back to. Mm -hmm. If you have 10 books, they will go any day like your first book, they will be more likely to go back and pick up all of your books. So, I will say it depends on what, uh, on what kind of books you make and how often you put out books and how many shows you go to to build an audience. Yeah, but, but as, a, as a possibility. It is possible if you have, it, what's more likely is uh, you, will, you will make a living once you have about five to 10 books, as long as you're going to a ton of shows. Because here's the thing, most people want to make a living selling books on Amazon as ebook, an ebook form. Mm-hmm. And ebooks have a maximum profit, a, a maximum cost of like $9.99. And like most people won't buy it at $9.99, which means your most, your maximum makes $7 a book because uh, uh, Amazon takes 30% roughly. So a $10 book, you make $7. Um, if I sell a thir- that $30 book back there, um, I'm uh, to, to somebody at a show. I make a twenty-seven dollar profit, and and you can talk to them, and I can talk to them and get them to buy multiple books. But 
I would rather have a $27 profit than a $7 profit. Mm. So, um, and this, and having a profit margin of that, uh, of that allows me to, you know, make more books like this funds for more books. This fun, like that allows me to cut the, the cost down if people buy multiple things. When it's just like anything else, people, you know, uh, that, that little thing, a lipstick that you buy, uh, lipstick or chapstick that you get for a dollar costs 10 cents to manufacture. So there's a 10x profit margin in that. And there should be a 10x profit margin in books. Like, so for the past two years, I've been studying everything about other businesses and figuring out how they're able to be successful. And one of them is book, book people tend to talk about a, a 3x profit margin, which is whatever the book costs to make, you multiply it by three. Six dollar book to make cost not sell it for sell it for uh, uh, eighteen dollars. Ten dollar book sell it for thirty. Um, that is completely backwards from how every other successful business operates. Every other successful business operates on a ten x or more profit margin, and that's because they need a they need a they need a large profit margin so that when it gets distribution, they can still make a hefty profit margin. Once it's done, they can they can give discounts at stores. They can they can go to shows and still have a profit once you sell. You know, once you do a book. When we were selling, we were making a book for seven and selling it for twenty. Once we got through show costs, there was nothing left. So we literally would lose money when we went to shows. So uh, the biggest thing is you got to treat it like a business. If you treat it like a business, then yes, like this is a product, not 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 unlike McDonald's uh, has a has a Big Mac or Burger King has a Whopper or Samsung has a phone. It is the same product. Uh, this, it, it is a product, and if you if you understand that it's a product, you can sort of take a lot of the the ways that people make money from these products and make a successful business. I would ask you. If someone opened a hamburger shop, would you think they could be successful in a year? Hmm. Okay, so you're saying that um, first thing before anything, if you want to be a successful writer, you need to realize that this is a business. Like, don't be quote unquote like a hippie. Like, this is uh, you know just just me writing and you know build it and they will come and I just write and people will buy it like. You have to what I tell people is if they are happy with the level that they are, the amount that they're making from their writing, then they should not do anything. But if they are unhappy, if they want to make more, then yes, they have to treat it like a business. What, what about maybe having a, a business partner who is like the business side while you're the artistic side? Does that, could that work or does that make I sense? I mean, it can work, but uh, you are opening, if you don't understand the business side of it, even if you don't do it well, you're opening up to getting screwed. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I believe that if you were the business side partner, you should, you should be able to write. If you're the if you're the writer side partner, you should be able to do the business. Mm -hmm. and, but you should both specialize in the thing. The specialty is important. But one of the things that I always like, I I have drawn a comic book in the past. It's called Gherkin Boy and the Dollar of Destiny. It's about a pickle that falls into a black hole. It's designed an adventure across the universe to get back home. It's weird. It looks terrible, but people still buy it. But I'm not going to be a professional artist. I'm going to outsource that. But I understand art. I understand page makeup and composition. I understand these pieces. So I can intelligently talk about them, but I don't, like, I don't do them. I, I also have editors on my books, but I know how to edit. I just, that's not my core competence. And my core competence is to write. But I'm able to have, to have an elevated conversation with people, um, and be able and understand these other things because I've studied them. So regardless, I think that if you want to be the, if you want to be in publishing uh, as the, as like a marketing director, the the publisher or whatever, you need to understand how to write. You don't have to be a great writer, but you have to understand how to write and do the artistic things, whatever you're trying to sell. You know, when I was selling cell phones, I understood the components of the cell phone and how it worked and, and all of that. But I, I couldn't go and fix it, couldn't go and fix a tower, but I understood it enough to be able to speak about it intelligently. In the same way, if you're the writer, you need to be able to, to go and 
and discuss the business stuff so that your business partner is, is, is treating you like a partner. Because it's a partnership. It's not a, this guy is being hired to do the business side. And I will say that years that for years I got screwed in many, many ways because I didn't understand website design. I didn't understand uh, the, how to, how to negotiate a contract. I, I didn't understand these things. So when people would say things to me, it would go in one ear and out the other. When I, when I sat down and learned all of this stuff and how it functioned and how brands functioned in here, I'll show you a, uh, uh, I was able to exponentially increase the, the, our brand. I don't have our brand, uh, our, our brand stuff here, but you can see, uh, this little B in, and this green background is the key to all of our marketing. We have the, we have green tablecloths. We have, we have B, we have a B on our website. We have all of our, all of our books have a little mm. B right there on the edge. Um, when we do our little giveaways at shows, this is our current giveaway at shows. It's a little B dressed as a monster. Like we have little buttons that are green with the B on it. Like if you understand the brand and you can, if you understand how other successful businesses built their brand, you can then take the best pieces of it and build your own brand and make, and, 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 and expect that it will work. This is the main thing that I don't understand why nobody does. I don't understand why people don't just go and steal all of the things that have been successful from all of these companies. And I don't mean like actually like pirate them. I mean, there's a reason why every burger joint looks like a McDonald's. There's a reason that every coffee chain looks like a Starbucks. There's a reason every gym looks like a gold gym. And it's because they don't have originality. It's because they model the success of the people before them. Yeah, yeah the, I uh, the second, I think it's called second, uh, there's the first people that try it, they get like the big reward. And then there's right. the people that get confidence from the people who succeeded, they get 20% of the reward and there's a lot more of them, but it's, it's a lot better than nothing. Right, exactly. And there are things that you can take, very simple things, like this V is incredibly cute. Why? Because MailChimp has an incredibly cute uh, monkey that is the core to all of their branding. And so it has a little like thingy, uh, like a little like mail uh, hat. Yeah. And they do a different one every month. So I was like, hey, I can't do a different every month. Maybe I can do one every quarter. Or I'll print a thousand of it, it, exclusive. You know, oh, look, people need a really cool cover. Because when you look at a cover like this, it means a lot more than a cover. I don't have any crappy covers around me, but it, it, like people are immediately drawn to that. Um, so I went to shows and I went to bookstores and I saw all the things that are successful in the exact kind of industry that I wanted to be. And then I just did that. And shockingly, shockingly, it's going to shock you. I know. <laughs> it worked. It didn't all work. But like, I kind of took what I liked about it and i made it my own thing and then like growth happened it's yeah. not that like sending out a weekly email is better than sending out a monthly email because people get more accustomed to seeing you constantly so when they see you in person they um you know they more likely to remember you and you can have a real conversation with them how, how about five videos a day that's a lot a lot of videos <laughs> a day but one a week and then sending it in your email would make sense because, uh, because then you're touching the audience. It's all about, I'm a firm believer that an audience will allow you to touch them as long as they give you a re you give them a reason, a new reason to, to be touched. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, by the way, it's important to, to tell. Uh, when I say five videos a day, I don't mean, right. hey, guys, it's just stupid shit. It's, it's, I do tons of coaching because that gives me the material to make uh, informative videos. So I have like a very high bar of quality. Not but necessarily there are people, filming, but, but content. Right, right, but there are people like John Lee Dumas that do a video a day. I watch a video, a Game of Thrones video every day because it's like a new, it's like a new like take on, The Last Heartbeat is a new like Game of Thrones video every day and I watch them. I don't necessarily watch them every day, but it's new, brand new, interesting you, content. You, you welcome it, yeah. 
I mean, yeah, I mean, I look forward to it because I like that content. And we are nothing if not ravenous for content or ravenous for content. Now, yeah. this becomes different when like the John Lee Dumas one works or the $100 MBA, the $100 MBA, the guy who does um, Webinar Ninja, I believe, I forget his name, but he did like an MBA course every day. And it was a 10 minute thing every day. So I, 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 I don't want to say discount that you can never, five times a day is way too much. But um, doing one really good video a day, I don't know. But then there are also people that are very successful that do one a, a week or one a month. Yes, uh, you know, yes. Like Seth Godin does, uh, does a lot. Um, but there are other people that do like, instead of doing one 300 every day, one 300 word post every day, they do like one 2000 word one or one or two times a week or one or two times a month. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's really important that, you know, you have this, this is what I do in like the actual one-on-one, -on -one, which I don't do that often anymore is it's easy to get this sort of baseline. Most people come to me when they don't even have a baseline. That's why I stopped doing one-on-one -on -one. because like, I was like, it's not even worth it for me to do a one-on-one -on -one with you because I'm literally going to be teaching you from kindergarten. You need to go and learn like, yeah, the, I, I know it. When, when you feel like you, there's something that you taught a lot, you made videos about, you wrote about, and you find yourself, I use the word rehashing, just kind of explaining something that they should have looked up before getting on a call with you. Right. I just don't like wasting their money. Like if you're paying me $2,000 a month for, for private coaching, like I will gladly, like I, I will take you step by step to it, but it's better if you've looked at a bunch of stuff and said, okay, now I need this personalized to me, you know, instead of, instead of, okay, let me teach you what a sales funnel is. And let me teach you what all this, let me teach you what these and this and this and this and this are. Um, I'd rather you like, I'm, I'm writing my first nonfiction book, which is basically what I'm going to hand to all people and be like, hey, man, read this, and then we'll talk. Yeah, actually get stuck somewhere. Don't just uh, wait at the starting line for somebody right, exactly. to take you. <laughs> right, exactly. Because I think that's, the, that's one of the things that people get wrong when they do all sorts of, uh, of, 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 of coaching. They're, they come from a point of zero. They come from zero, a place of zero. And then when they don't get a lot out of the coaching, Sorry, I should say this is why people don't. I, 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 this is why I think people don't get a lot out of the people that don't get a lot out of coaching, one-on-one -on -one coaching. This is why I think it's because they come from a place of zero, and then they pay two thousand dollars a month, and by the end of that first month, they're at one. And you're like, like, what the hell did I just pay for? I could have looked this stuff up online. And I'm like, you're right. You could have looked this up online. I, I, I don't know why you didn't because the value of me or, or of a coach is that we've done it before. And if you come with, if you've already, if you already know these 10 concepts, I can now take it and individualize it to you. If you don't know those 10 concepts, I have to explain those 10 concepts to you when you could have just read it online. Because there are a lot of things you can read online, but it ain't everything. There is a yeah. point that the internet has basically said, we're gonna teach this information for free, but anything else, no, -uh. like that's <laughs> where we have to more personalized, right? Have you found that yourself? Um, well, what I found regarding what you said about um, the, the, the time thing, it's uh, I, I explain to everybody that I work with, like, I'm going to teach you the process. And if you're just, you know, we're going to customize a process for you, that's going to work. But whatever that process will be, it's not like you do it and then it immediately works. It's like the gym. You do it and then you're gradually going to see increasing results. But with the internet, you're going to see increasing results exponentially. So let's say somebody wants to also coach. I tell them about uh, attention. So I explain them, okay, within two or three months, I'm, I'm pretty much, I can pretty much guarantee you're going to get your first client. But the first month or so, it's going to be pretty boring. Like unless you do something really impressive, which isn't sustainable anyway, because you just started. So basically, it's it's like a it's like a rocket that's taking off, and most people don't realize like that 
I mean, there, there are two axioms which I, I talk about with my, you know, anybody who I'm coaching or people who watch my videos. And the first one, I th which I think is the most important one, is I say, just, just be consistent. Like, even if you're doing it wrong, just, just don't stop. Like, just keep being consistent because time will exponentially right. grow everything. So, so you'll never see somebody who goes to the gym every day or even, you know, three, four times a week for five years and he still looks the same. Like, you see people who just started, you see people who maybe quit, you see people who are really great at it, but where's that guy? You know, where's the guy who's doing it wrong right. well, for I think like 10 yeah. years? Like, where is he? He doesn't that exist. Guy does, that guy who does it wrong eventually gets it right because he's like either hiring, he's like, he's, he's self-correcting himself or he's finding the things that he does really well and the things that he wants to do. I think that's so important is to just start. Like what you said, is just like do it and do it consistently. My podcast yeah. we've been doing for, most of this year we've got 140 episodes now and most of the people tell me when they come and say oh thank you for this the thing or that it's great it's the consistency so if you just keep doing it like you just you've not you didn't stop you hit this like threshold point and you just keep going keeps coming up in my thing so i keep listening to it but the minute that you stop that consistency the people's attention is gone like I always yeah. tell people, if I stop going to shows, people would forget about me in a month. I almost view it like you lose credibility. Like uh, you, there's so many people who are like, hey guys, I'm making a YouTube channel, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, you know, everybody's automatically like, is he going to stop on the first week? Is he going to stop on the first two months? You know, and most people don't want you to stop, but it's like you just predict like, when will this guy stop? And what I noticed is that at certain milestones, like even my haters started like commenting, like, like one of my haters, one guy was like, you know, a hater <laughs> commented like, you know, the hate comment as usual, but he started off by saying, look, irregardless of me being a hater and I'm paraphrasing respect for the consistency because, because I have been doing five videos every single day for I think almost three months now. So that, that's literally like, um, that's like 90 times five. That's like 400 videos. Right. And so he's like, respect, you know, you're doing it wrong. You're an idiot. I hate you, but respect for being consistent. Right. Um, so, so yeah, uh, there's the milestones where you maybe start a channel. Nobody notices. And then after the first week or so, a bit of people notice because they're like, oh, so he's not going away yet. And then you do it for a month. People are like, oh, so maybe he's staying a bit more. And, and the more you do it, the more you kind of gain people's confidence in you. Because I, when I look at people commenting on my channel, every time somebody comments on my channel for the first time, like it's still not that big that I can't remember who comments and who doesn't. Every time I see a new comment, I'm like, I'm so grateful. Thank you for making this comment because I know that this person probably watched like four or five, six, 10 videos and only now has the, the confidence in me to do that because it's an investment to actually write your opinion when, every, when not everybody's doing it. So uh, like you said, you're touching people. So every time somebody comments, somebody new comments or somebody, um, you know, just does anything related to me, talking to me. I'm like, okay, it's somebody that I've like penetrated that, that threshold where he now views me as a person. He sees me as somebody who's part of his life, who's not going to go away. So he right. trusts me to, to connect with me, to communicate. Right. Well, I mean, that's, there's, so I simple, I have a very simplified sales funnel that I teach people because uh, um, I think sales is, is way easier than most people make it out to be. Um, and I think the reason that people, that there are sales trainers, so many sales trainers is because they make it more complicated than necessary. So there's three stages of, a, of, of to me, there's three stages of, of, a, uh, of a person who is going to buy from you. The, the bottom stage is that they, they consider buying from you. The first is that they know you. Second is that, so, that, so if, it's, if it's like this, first thing is they know you, then they have to like you, and they have to trust you, then they will consider buying from you, and then they will buy from you. At each level of that, 
people see people fall off that. So a lot of people have to go into the top of the chipper shredder to get to the bottom of the chipper shredder. But one of the ways that you do that is through buying triggers. And one of the biggest buying triggers is commitment. So what you're talking about is you're making a commitment to your brand um, by continuing to show videos and they're making a commitment to you to watch the videos. And every time you post a video, you're affirming your commitment to your brand, to, to your audience. And every time that they comment or like or view, they're, they're, they're renewing their commitment to you. Yeah. Now, now I just have a simple question for you, okay? Sure. Let's say that I manage to stay consistent with this. Right now we're at 2016 for five years. So lit literally we're talking about 7,000, maybe 8,000 videos every day for five years. Uh -huh. I like what I think would happen. I, I'm not sure if I said this is a question or not. Um, what I think would happen is something like watch mojo, you know, the YouTube channel where they basically just, it's like CNN. They just upload shit like all day long, like every three, four hours, just upload, 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 upload. Is that basically every video, like you said, it's like, it's like books. It's like, the more books you have, the more people have to go to. So I, I exhaust topics so quickly because of I'm making, you know, so many videos. After, it's like this topic. Okay. I, I, I killed it. The, the, I can't even talk about it anymore. And then this one, then this one, then this one. So it's going to like spread out. Imagine like 7,000 anchors on every topic known to man that I can talk about, you know, uh, on, a, on an expertise level. So the way I, I think it will happen, I might be wrong, but what I think will happen is like, imagine like a, a huge, like the Titanic and I'm like pulling down many, many anchors to try to like uh, uh, push it down. And then eventually there's this uh, critical mass moment where there's so much content there that the whole ship like bam, like, like flips off and then all hell breaks loose. And then like, all the 7,000 videos, like you see somebody like uh, Jack Septicai, you know, he's a PewDiePie fan and he's made like 200, 300 videos before uh, PewDiePie, you know, kind of made him famous. So now you look back at his videos, you know, so his first video doesn't have like 20 views anymore. It doesn't have, you know, the second video doesn't have 30 views. They have like, you know, 100,000, 200,000, 50,000, 100,000. So like you said about the books, it's retroactive. People, when you get famous, people check out the previous content and, and, and they fill it up. So you have like more cups to fill up. So, so uh, I might be wrong, but I, I believe that's what will happen. Like suddenly, bam, like a flood because everybody would watch all the videos. So if I had to guess, if you were doing this for five years, and had 7,000 videos. Hey, your 7,000 video will be way better than your 100th video or your 400th video. Oh, yeah. And you, and, and you would also uh, very, uh, the, so the problem with creating 7,000 videos, if they're all over the spectrum, is they're not necessarily um, made for one individual person. They're not from one customer, customer avatar. Yeah, I mean, going in, to in, in my case, it is. In my case, um, so, I talk so about. If are, so if yeah. they are, hang on. So if they are, um, I think you're going to get much. I, I think it will be much better defined who that avatar is in four and a half years, four years and nine months, however long it's been. Also, the production quality will go up uh, significantly. Um, and just because that's what will happen with everyone, every, even Buzzfeed, the production quality will go up in five years because like there'll be more production stuff in five years. Right? The more you do it, the better it gets, you know? Right. So it'll be, so I, I mean, I can already tell if you go back to like the first couple episodes of my podcast, it's these new ones are way better, but yes, people do still go back to the, to the beginning ones and listen to those. I don't know why they do that because they're not as good. The interviews are good, but the rest of the content, not so good. I, I think, I think uh, people do that because they want to see your journey. Like I, I know I definitely did that with a lot of people.
Right. So I went to uh, when I, I do. I used to read a lot of web comics. Less now because I'm more busy. But like, if you go back to something like the beginning of Penny Arcade or the beginning of XKCD or the beginning of a lot of other ones, um, you'll see the the you'll see the um, the journey. Like you'll see how bad they were comparatively to what they are now, or how different. Sometimes they're not bad at the beginning, but they are much cruder. They're much different. They're definitely yeah. don't look like the same thing as they are now. And that was what happens over time. You get better at defining your audience. You get better knowing what your audience needs too. So mm -hmm. even if somebody is, um, so even if somebody is uh, very honed in their customer profile, you may not necessarily know what that customer wants or needs until they actually like, until you get one that has like a thousand views and you're like, Oh, that I should probably replicate that and then you do it and that one gets another thousand views and all the other ones get like very little right yeah and but then like you go okay so if I do that and that and that and these if I focus on these four things I focus on interviews I focus on like short tips maybe I break my long piece up into like 10 short ones and do like 10 things if I do these four things it will increase but you don't know the, the, the things that my audience wants changes a lot over time and it takes time for me to like drop those pins and see which ones like have sold it, it, it yeah. makes 10 or three to five books a year and hopefully one of them goes gangbusters and the other ones do well enough to su sustain yeah but the the more the bigger your audience and the more track record you have uh the easier it is to like your audience will tell you what they want but your audience also you have, gets bigger when you have that hit. Like when you have a shareable viral yeah, hit, yeah. like then you'll be like, oh, that one got a thousand. I'm going to do more like that. But again, like to me, there's a book called The Pumpkin Plan uh, by Michael Michalowicz, who uh, talks about a lot of stuff. The, the thing that I take away is not the thing most other people take away. Uh, the thing that I take away is uh, he, The Pumpkin Plan is about uh, how and very simplifying about how big uh, pumpkins, like state champion winning pumpkins, exist, yeah, come to be. And uh, basically, what happens is they plant all the pumpkin seeds, and they harvest the ones that are the biggest, and they and then they, they they breed those, and then they harvest the ones that are the biggest from that, and they just keep breeding the biggest pumpkins. But they, that's the thing most people get away with it. But I, what I get away with it is planting all of the seeds is the only way to know how to get the biggest pumpkins. So if you don't know, if you don't plant all the seeds, not doing a YouTube channel and a blog, all whatever the things, writing books and all of those things, if you're not like negotiating your own contracts and doing all these things and doing the sales and the marketing and going to, if you don't do all of it, you don't know which one's gonna catch on. Like for me, <laughs> going to shows and then showing, uh, going to shows, doing a podcast, writing books and showing other people how to make a successful business is the thing that caught on for me. But for sure, it's not going to be somewhat some, the same thing that catches on to somebody else. And so like by doing 7,000 videos, you're definitely going to have a lot of seeds planted. And by planting a lot of seeds, my, my, uh, my thought, what I, what I think would happen is you'll see four, like maybe 10 seeds that keep consistently uh, growing the biggest. And then you'll yeah. plant those seeds, and, the, and then out of those 10, you'll see three that keep getting the biggest. And then yeah. from those three, you'll find one that grows the biggest, and that's the thing. And that yeah. happens when you have a, so, and then yes, you'll have the other, you'll have all of it. You'll have all of the things also to go back to, but you'll have the big Mama Jamma one as well. That's the like the calling card. Like shit, I need to make five thousand dollars right now. What can I do? Well, if I make a video about pandas making out with each other, it'll get me five thousand dollars. I know it. I just know it will. Like I know because like I have four other videos of pandas making out with each other and they all netted me five thousand dollars. So my audience wants that. Yeah. And boom, there. You know, does that make sense? Ex yeah, extremely. Yeah, that that's why uh, what I like about making so many videos is that 
it basically puts me in a situation where I have to experiment because, you know, everybody fluctuates during the day. So I'm in different locations and different moods, different topics. I run out of topics. So I sometimes make like a depressed video, a happy video, an angry video, an energetic video, a calm video. Inside, you make ones here. I've seen that some of them, like they're in different places. And you might see that the ones that you're outside walking down are the ones that are the biggest, the biggest. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I made, I made a video today, you know, I, I just got this girl. I basically just, uh, started walking and bam, like felt a ton of energy, just started ranting, not even a topic specifically, just talking about goals. And, and this girl wrote down, wrote, wrote, wrote a comment like, Robbie, I'm so glad I found your channel. It's my birthday, but I'm not even going to celebrate. I'm just sitting and binging on your videos because they're so valuable. Thank you. And when I read it, I was like, oh my God, like, this is what I do this for. Like, like, you know, and, and by the way, regarding experimentation, you, maybe you know that, you know, maybe you, you uh, experienced that, maybe not, but I've, I've had days, again, because I made so many videos every day, I don't have the luxury of you know, preparing content or getting, you know, getting myself pumped up for it. I, 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 sometimes I just don't have what to talk about. I have to like out of thin air, come up with something, you know, something that will help people. Cause again, the channel is about coaching. So, uh, one day I made this video in my car, just literally driving in my car and just filming. And I, I, I just, I thought it was a really shit video. Like I was like, yeah, and this, and this, and they just talked about this topic for like 20 minutes. And I thought it was a really bad video. I was like, okay, yeah, let's upload it anyway, whatever. And a few people wrote down like in the comments, like, dude, that's like your best video, one of your best videos ever. And I'm like, really? <laughs> and and, and I, so I learned, oh, people like it when I'm depressed because they relate with that. They like it when I'm negative. They like it when I'm happy. They like it when I don't have anything to talk about. Um, and you're going to find that over time. And, yeah, yeah, by by yeah, like cool. slowly pushing the boundary on everything. Yep. Because again, the, the whole thing, the whole reason the pumpkin thing works, it's because every action naturally has a variation to it. No action is the same as the previous one. So if this is like the, you know, the the scope of the things you've done, then this action has a bit of variation here, a bit of a variation here. So. So every time you expand the box a bit and you're like, oh, this works, this works, this works, this works. And mm -hmm. now you're comfortable with more stuff. And uh, I, I also notice I expand that comfort zone on a business level. Like, oh, bigger audience, you know, more money per sale, uh, better ways of closing. And you just grow variations on everything. So mm -hmm. every single part of the business that you do just gets better yep. with time. So one, one last thing is that um, what I tell people is to do the pumpkin thing, but not just in uh, their marketing strategy, but like even I'm like, I, I made a video yesterday. I told people like, look, the reason you're not great, the reason you're like, you don't amount to anything in all your years of, of trying things is simply because you haven't committed to something. You're always like jump. Oh, maybe this, maybe this is the one, maybe this is the business. Maybe I'll do this. Maybe I'll do this but you never really commit to something and just keep going when it gets boring. So, so, um, I, I mean, yeah, that's like the pumpkin theory in of its own. Right. For sure. Anyway. Um, so if I'm somebody who wants to write books and like you said, it's, it's not really a good idea to start, you know, <laughs> experimenting on your own without, you know, having somebody who knows shit, <laughs> How would you recommend people get help from you? All right, so uh, my name is Russell Nolte, R-U-S-S-E-L-L-N-O-H-E-L-T-Y, -L -L and my website is russellnolte.com. I'll, I'll include the description in the bottom, by the way. Awesome, awesome. And it, it has uh, a link where you can set up a 30-minute call with me. That, as Robbie can tell you, will probably end up being an hour. Um, <laughs> um, also, it has my blog, which has my podcast, The Business of Art, as well as other musings that I have. Um, if you just want the podcast, The Business of Art, if I had to turn your art into a business, 
We've got over 130 episodes, including interviews, tips, tricks, live shows at thebusinessofart.us. It's also available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and everywhere else you get your uh, podcasts. And then if you want to see how we do it ourselves, uh, wannabepress.com is my publishing company. Join our mailing list. You get some free comics. And then uh, those are the three main things. I have a new book coming out uh, hopefully next year about uh, called Sell Your Soul, How to Build a Creative Career. Um, and that's the best, like the best thing to do is reach out and at least see where you stand now. Uh, go to the site, sign up, schedule a call, and then, you know, it's free, no obligation. Um, if you're in a place that looks good to make a book, you know, we can go from there. If not, I will be very honest and frank and tell you the sorts of things you need to do. Uh, but it, it takes no time to just go to our site and uh, look at our blog, um, Business of Art or either RussMolte.com. Yeah, I, I talked, again, I talked personally to Russell and uh, this was probably the most like brutally honest uh, talk I ever had. Like, like when he doesn't think you know something is like, no, like you don't know that, you know, you're not doing it right. <laughs> he doesn't sugarcoat it, which I really appreciate. Uh, and uh, just to make sure I might've missed it. Where can people get your books? Maybe on digital, like uh, the comic books? Not- my digital books are all on Amazon. Uh, you can just type in my name or you can go to wannabepress.com and uh, the hard covers for, for uh, Ichabod and Katrina are only available on our website, uh, but everything else is available on Amazon. Just type in my name, Russell Nolte. Um, I'll definitely be getting the comics. Uh, it's been a long time. My last comics was Batman. I binged right. it two years ago. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, there's definitely all the digitals are on our site too. So if you just want the digital copies because you're international, not in America, you can get them all on um, the Wannabe Press website. Perfect. Website. Perfect. Awesome, dude. Thank you so much. Thank you, man. Have a great day. You too.